let's open the floor to to a discussion then. Um, if you could, um, when you ask a question, just introduce yourself and also um, state which presenter you're um, addressing your question to. I might group several questions together and then respond to them in a collective way. And there is a roaming mic somewhere. Great. I have a question, two questions on that. Um, I enjoyed all the papers, so uh, thank you very much. Um, I have just two uh, comments, cum uh, questions. The first one is on uh, the uh, Yusuf uh, Sumner paper. Uh, basically, what you're dealing with is a dynamic system, which is based on the structural transformation. And what is very clear is that the share of uh, employment in agriculture, as well as the share of uh, GDP in agriculture, is going to fall over the course of the structural transformation. What happens in terms of other sectors depends very much on the initial conditions in terms of globalization, as well as the policies followed by the, uh, by the government. And uh, in this slide, it's very clear that the uh, development model in Africa is going to be very different from the development model that was so successful in East Asia and uh, uh, Asia in, in general. Now, my question is, um, I had the feeling sometimes that you assumed some separability instead of looking at the, uh, uh, the whole complex dynamic model, which is really interdependent, you, you were looking at different sectors as if the, there was possibility of making some of these sectors more important than others. So w what I would like to see is the specification of a dynamic model based on initial conditions as well as uh, policies. Um, on the uh, uh, very good presentation of uh, James and, and uh, uh, Sabina, um, First of all, I, I feel that clearly poverty is multidimensional. So any attempt at uh, coming up with some kind of an indicator of multidimensional poverty is a very important exercise. Um, what I was wondering about, and of course they know this from previous meetings, um, there is still a lot of arbitrariness in any attempt at a multidimensional indicator. Uh, the various dimensions are considered to be more or less equal. Uh, Cut-off ratios tend to be arbitrary. And I was wondering if through more work on sensitivity analysis, for instance, taking different cut-off ratios perhaps making certain dimensions relatively more important than others, one could, and maybe with the help of focus group, come up with a uh, specification which would make it possible to uh, add some weight to the various dimensions and also give us more confidence in terms of the uh, cut-off deprivation levels. Thank you. Um, thanks. I think we had another question a few rays um, behind. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting presentations. Uh, Javier Jara from the University of Essex. Um, on the first presentation, I was wondering to which extent the role of the tax benefit system was uh, left behind the scenes and the, the role of the tax benefit system was left behind the scenes, and it's actually this which would be considered important in terms of how to react uh, in reducing poverty as one of the goals. Uh, one of the things I was thinking of perhaps was why not try to decompose the genie into the contribution of tax benefit policies and the contribution of all other components, and that might give us an idea in the 
in the equation. Another way to do it was to ask ourselves whether under the uh, current budget of each country, uh, that each country is allocating social, social assistance, for instance, we are targeting well those who are considered the poor and how much would poverty be reduced if we could target better and then take the patterns of projections in terms of uh, economic growth and population growth and see how much uh, or to which extent tax benefit policies should cope, should adapt in order to achieve the goal. Um, on the last presentation, my comment was really in line to the previous comment in terms of something was mentioned very quickly and briefly was that all dimensions are equally valued. And I was wondering to which extent this is a strong assumption and mainly put it into the context of the literature by Mark Florbet that has been rising uh, during these uh, last years, to which extent should we account for the fact that different individuals might value different uh, life dimensions in a different way? Great, thanks. So if we just take the question on the back row as well and then we'll respond to those together. Uh, Rolf van der Hoeven of the Institute of Social Studies. Also, thanks for the papers. i like to uh, comment on the first paper by Andrea Cornia. I think he very nicely with more variables showed that if you have a situation where the poverty line is high and very high in relation to uh, per capita income, it's indispensable that you need growth in order to reduce poverty. And we found that already 20 years ago, but you put more variables in it to make that point. My point, my question is more on, uh, on policy. Uh, in y y your last simulation, you add only 1% of growth to the IMF uh, projections and then you come to results which are better but not acceptable yet. Um, if you look at some African countries, they have shown very high growth rates. I point to Ethiopia, to Rwanda. So the question is, why did you restrict yourself to an experiment with only 1% more additional growth? Why didn't you include experiments with more growth rates, a bit more robuster? Uh, this is completely in line with the sustainable development goals, with some of the goals. We don't need to go into that. Thank you. Great, thanks. We'll just respond to these questions and then go back for another round. Unless your question, is your question directly related? Okay, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> well, as we all know, everything is related. <laughs> After all, I'm an ecologist. <laughs> Um, well, um, we, we, I think we all agree that we, that um, poverty is caused, is a multi, the reason for poverty is multidimensional. Um, but I'm wondering whether in this direction we have considered the influence of culture in, in uh, poverty, on poverty. For example, uh, nu let's take nutrition. You might have some cultures which do not have taboos about eating certain foods and that might affect their nutritional um, intake um, or have we considered external influences on the economies and poverty for instance um, if you compare Norway and a country like Goa Norway the government of Norway derives about 98 percent of its oil revenue for the country itself and for the people of Norway so they're just thinking rich while in the case of Goa a, a, about 90 or more percent goes to the investors, like a company in the UK, and a peanut is given to the people of Goa, and so they remain poor. Uh, the other aspect, which it seems to me was not covered, is the impact of manipulating the indices of poverty and improving equality, uh, the level of equality, the influence of doing that on the environment. I think this is very fundamental question. Because, for example, if you improve agricultural production, you might need to cut down large areas of forest. If you improve export crops from agriculture, again, you do the same thing, like they are doing in Indonesia, Malaysia, other Asian countries, including India, and so on. So we have to really consider this because we did consider population growth, which is important, but also population growth at a local level can extend into destruction of the environment and climatic change, etc. Great. Thank you for those really interesting questions. Um, James, do you want to start at the center? The last question is for you. 
No, but that's fine. I'll be <laughs> called it. Uh, the uh, idea of normalizing indices to make it, you know, more salient between 0, 1 versus between odd numbers and so on, I, I agree that that can be quite helpful. And in fact, if you go back to the FGT2, one of the problems is the numbers just don't make sense. But if you take into a square root of FGT2, numbers start making a lot more sense and looking like equally distributed equivalents. And so I've thought for a long time that that's such a nice way of proceeding, but then immediately you jump up against decomposability. So you want to keep decomposability, so you trade off uh, simplicity. Uh, as far as the other measure is concerned, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure whether normalization would help in that case. It might, uh, but I'm all game to explore that. Uh, more confidence, because the cutoffs might be arbitrary. Anything in poverty is arbitrary, for goodness sake, at the end of the day. And so I don't, um, I don't have as much problem with arbitrariness compared to other people, I guess. But uh, on the other hand, pretty much all the estimates that have come out from every country and from any global MPI now has been subjected to a ton of sensitivity analyses. And this is now par for the course and standard across the board. So this is now happening, what you've suggested is happening as, as we speak. I, I point out that there's an index called the Better Job Index uh, at the Inter-American Development Bank that uses exactly the same technology of the MPI. Uh, you can change your weights right there online and see what happens to job uh, quality or employment conditions. So it's quite amazing what you can now do online interactively. Um, as far as, uh, let's see, uh, should uh, all equally valued? No, they're not. Just the example was uh, the approach can do anything you want. I have seen that uh, there's natural tendency to do uh, nested equal, which means go to the main dimensions and give them equal weight because they are equally important. And then if you happen to have different numbers of indicators, well, keep the weight on the dimension the same, but you know, make equal the weight within so that you don't screw up this weighting across dimensions. So that's now the way that people have been doing it. It's a natural way of proceeding, but you get to do what you want. Chile added 10% to uh, another indicator when they, when they threw it in. Um, I actually don't understand Florbe's approach. And if someone can explain it to me, I'd be very happy to, to look it over. Um, it's a different entity in a sense because we're talking about policy here and policy then gets together to set the target for the country or for groups of countries. And that's can be informed by individual preferences and individual things. But at the end of the day, you have to choose something and go with it. Okay. Um, finally, uh, manipulating, oh, culture. Yes, if you got data, we'll go for it and incorporate it into all that we're measuring. That's the missing dimensions is the second half of OFI, finding the, the, the data to incorporate things that are really important, including environment, including um, uh, context, uh, you know, and if you have these environmental externalities and can measure it so that we understand what's going on and the incentives that are, we're, we're in, into it. It's really interesting for us. So uh, we'll be happy to accommodate uh, in terms of measurement if we can only get those missing dimensions out and uh, establish as part of the data set. That's it that I'll say, so I'll leave it to you all. Uh, thank you. Uh, on Paula's note, perhaps, uh, I think, both of the uh, questions raised to our particular to our presentation, I think both are challenge of extending our works. Yeah? And on Paula notes, I think it's very relevant challenge, especially for Indonesia, because uh, in, in, in relation to our data, because uh, we are using district data, so it's sub-national, sub-sub-national level, where after 2000, for example, the decentralization uh, reform in Indonesia has moved the the you know the, the the responsibility of several important policy such as education and health to those district sectors so so that's very relevant uh, and also I would like to add uh, I read one of uh, one paper and also confirmed with our data for example that higher access to higher education is very much highly highly correlated with inequality in Indonesia mm -hmm. very much highly but higher education not other educations. So thanks for the challenge. And on Eric's, actually, first of all, I would like to thank the, the Eric for, for the comments. Uh, I, I, I'm honored 
Why? Because Eric is a supervisor of my supervisors at the Australian National National University. Right. Right. So that right. make me my incident. So yeah, I think yeah we we have to look at. Uh, uh, I know that we, our paper is lacking of uh, fr uh, framework. Actually, I think we should extend the framework of the work into more dynamic kind of work. So I think we'll try to look to look, to look into it, and then maybe when we get it, we can come back to it later, <laughs> and then maybe. Andy would add something. Some more. I mean, I think there is a basic methodological choice. I mean, when, uh, uh, first of all, we just wanted to look at the eradication of poverty. So the question raised by Paola, Italiana? Boliviana. Boliviana. Okay. So, um, so the question is, uh, uh, if you want to include uh, health, education, and so on and so forth, and since we are using, inshallah, uh, net incomes distributions, I and mean, then you know this uh, big databases. Uh, I mean, you get what you you can get, but I mean, these are the, the best data you can. Get. So, if uh, for instance, if I have a better distribution of better targeting of benefits, Gini will be lower. Okay, if I have um, more expenditure on education, well, on particularly if it is well targeted, Gini will be lower. Same with health and so on and so forth. So, <clears throat> so there is an issue that. Uh, the, the fact of uh, the multidimensionality comes through via uh, the level of the Gini and the growth rate of GDP, basically. And, uh, and we had that, and then of course, separated the population issue. So if you have uh, a good public health uh, cum uh, family planning system, N will be lower. So, so the variables, that these are the media determinants which are um, capturing the fact of many other dimensions. And I th this goes back to a long, uh, long ago when uh, Martin, I don't know if you are right or wrong, but uh, I think that uh, you claimed and other people, including myself, claimed that uh, if, you take, if you took the correlation between infant mortality, in those days it was with UNICEF, and um, Gini, then you do find that they, you have uh, an R of uh, 0, 07, 0, 08, 0, 09. Perhaps not everything is there, you know. So, and then I didn't estimate any equation. I just used the decomposition. And the decomposition uses two, param two three parameters, which I took from theoretical distributions. So the effect of health, education, and so on and so forth, transits via, G via gr GDP growth rate. And except one, because these are all done, all the calculations are done in uh, current prices. And then there's all, the, all this literature that showing that uh, if uh, there is a changes in relative prices between food and, and non-food, actually the poor are much more penalized. And so then you have to take into account that. And there are at least six or seven papers, including one we, which we have done. So th this is the key point. Uh, and uh, otherwise, what, what should have been? Uh, and actually in the paper, which is available, uh, we say, okay, we do a, a, a multi-equation system in which we have on the left-hand side poverty eradication and then SDG number two, number three, number four, num number five, and you will find very, a lot of interaction between these um, indicators. So I didn't really feel there was a need in this particular case I mean, to uh, have uh, uh, multidimensionality because the effects of better health, better education, and so on and so forth, they do reflect themselves to a very large degree. It's not like uh, R equal one, but R equal a lot. A very high, a very high degree. So this is the basic premise. So when I talk about uh, immediate determinants, this is the logic of it. And uh, now I think that um, <clears throat> why why did we limit the the growth rate of the African countries uh, uh, to a plus one percent on top of what the IMF said? Well, because the IMF came up with um, this data, and here I tend to agree with uh, the, the findings of in on Indonesia. Because we find on Africa, in another study we did for uh, UNDP Africa, we do find that a, a large part of the explanation of the increase in inequality in Africa is the wrong pattern of structural transition. The, inequal, inequ, uh, the share of uh, agriculture falls, the share of manufacturing falls. That's the, that's the drama. Normally, you say you go to a low inequality sector, which is agriculture, unless you have latifundia and uh, uh, white settlers and so on and so forth. Then you move to 
simple and skilled labor intensive manufacturing. This has a low gene. This are, we have data for 18 African countries on a panel. And then actually you jump into modern services, very hygiene, or the informal services sector, including government, which you, which you have, very hygiene. So this is the non-Rostovian. I mean, I'm not uh, making publicity for Walter Rostov, mm -hmm. but I mean, I think that it's very difficult to claim that Africa will develop by concentrating more in, on agriculture and on tertiary in the tertiary sector. And so there is a major problem of uh, who's going to do manufacturing in Africa. This is the question, you know? And the, 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 the domestic industry is, has been declining in line with trade liberalization. Actually, who captures that? Well, the Vietnamese, the Chinese, the Indians, and so on and so forth. So is that fair? Is it, is it useful for inequality in Africa? No, I don't think it is. Now, perhaps the foreign direct investment, you know, the, the Chinese are transplanting some, uh, uh, Hualien, who is the, one of the major uh, cheap shoe producer, moved to Ethiopia, and, uh, uh, and wages in China are, I don't know, 400 a month, and uh, in, in Addis Ababa there are 50, 50 a month, so perhaps, but we, is it safe to have an industrialization entirely in the end of foreign direct investment? It's a bit risky, because tomorrow there may be some, some some other countries offering better conditions. So, so I think that when I, I say, well, we in, increase the growth rate of Africa by 1%, this is, I think, is, uh, I don't want to say optimistic, but uh, I mean, the, the growth rate of Africa basically has been depending on commodity prices. And commodity prices have been high, and now they go up and down. And so the IMF in his own uh, super wise assessment has come up with the idea that uh, over up to 2022, and then we extended it. Uh, we'll, uh, so there is this basic issue of reprimarization in Africa and Latin America. And if you read uh, Jose Antonio Campo, actually you see that the argument is, which, he, which he made is that, um, well, I mean, the developing countries, let's say Africa, the commodity produce, Latin America and Africa, will, will develop fast enough to eradicate poverty. If basically China delinks to the growth of Western I mean, of the OECD country, China exports a lot of commodities. Uh, sorry, a lot of manufactured goods to the U.S. and to Europe. If uh, now the, the the trade war is successful, I mean, in the sense that Trump gets it his own way, then actually the economies will slow down, and they will import fewer commodities from uh, Africa, fewer commodities from Latin America, and the growth rate in these two countries, which have reprimarized because share of manufacturing is falling and uh, will slow down as well. So 1% is not too pessimistic, Rolf, I think, is uh, in, 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 from this perspective. And, uh, and I think that uh, this is the... Um, so but the, the methodologically, the key issue is that the effects of health, education, and so on and so forth are reflected in genes and, gro and growth rates. If you are healthy, you will produce more. I mean, this microeconomic literature. And then on, on how, how much more to uh, raise the growth rate of Africa, and particularly of Africa, is basically, I think, risky. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not obvious that uh, with, with the, the, the trends in the global economy, Africa will export more commodities. And I think it's wrong that Africa and Latin America should uh, limit themselves to the exportation of uh, primary commodities to the commodity producers, to the manufacturer producers. Thank you. Um, well, apologies, we've run out of time for another round of questions, um, but I'm sure all the presenters will be happy to, to speak to you and answer any questions you have over the course of the next few days. Um, so in the meantime, all that's left to say is um, thank you very much for attending the session.